Hello, everyone. Thank you to the almost 150 participants joining us today for the launch of the report, The Impact of the War on Yemen's Justice System. Today's event will be held in English, and we will also have Arabic interpretation. Please select the language that is most appropriate for you at the bottom of your screen. My name is Milena Stereo, and I'm the Managing Director at the Public International Law and Policy Group, and also the Charles R. Emmerich Jr. Coffey Halter and Griswold Professor of Law at Cleveland State University's Cleveland Marshall College of Law. I will be moderating today's discussion, and I'm honored to be guiding the conversation with these experts. The Public International Law and Policy Group is a global pro bono law firm providing free legal assistance to parties involved in peace negotiations, drafting post-conflict constitutions, war crimes prosecution, transitional justice, and human rights documentation. Over the past year, our team has been fostering the development of a thought leadership initiative. This initiative focuses on a range of topics from prominent international law issues to pressing global conflicts. Through organizing periodic roundtables, our aim is to share expertise and reflections from our work on peace negotiations, post-conflict constitution drafting, and war crimes prosecution. Today's event is to launch the report, The Impact of the War on Yemen's Justice System, published in November 2021 by the Public International Law and Policy Group in partnership with Deep Root Consulting and the International Legal Assistance Consortium. Deeproot is a boutique consulting firm passionate about Yemen's development. Deeproot's goal is to help anchor development interventions in a deep understanding of Yemen's local and national context, as well as international best practices. Through a wide network of Yemeni and international experts and specialists, Deeproot ensures that its services always stem from on the ground knowledge. Seven years of war in Yemen have had a devastating impact on the country and its people, leading to the world's largest humanitarian crises. Although the topic has received less attention, Yemen's justice system and day-to-day -day legal practices have inevitably also been affected by the war. Yemen has witnessed an ever-changing landscape of military and political control over certain areas, fragmenting the country's justice system amongst authorities in control. Alongside fragmentation of justice institution, local actors have emerged to take on informal roles in the delivery of justice where the state is effectively absent, the war solidifying their position of power over local communities. The ongoing conflict and resulting instability have exacerbated pre-existing challenges to the rule of law and delivery of justice throughout Yemen with citizens in need of justice bearing the brunt of the problem. Through in-depth research and data collection, Deep Root and the Public International Law and Policy Group assessed the overall impact of the war on Yemen's justice system, identifying key challenges to both formal and informal legal structures. Data collection took place throughout April and June 2021 in six governorates, namely Aden, Hadramut, Eid, Marib, Sana, and Taiz. During this event, we will delve into the report's research methodology key findings and recommendations to offer insight into the justice system of Yemen today. The roundtable will be 60 minutes long. Our esteemed panelists include the author and editor of the report, Mohammed al shuwaider and Emma Bakum, as well as Rafat al alkali and Ethar Shaibani. Today's event will be recorded and subsequently posted on our website. We ask that you please submit any questions you have for our speakers using the Q&A function and we will do our best to answer your questions towards the end of this event. Now, please allow me to introduce our panelists. From Deep Root, we're excited to welcome Mohammed al shuwaider Mohammed is a legal consultant specialized in international law, human rights, and Yemeni law. Mohammed has worked as a constitutional consultant with the Rapporteur of the Constitutional Drafting Committee, a legal researcher with the Ministry of Justice, and has provided consulting services to a number of international organizations, including the World Bank. Mohammed has pre also previously contributed to PILPG as a research associate. We're also, we're also pleased to welcome Rafat al alkali co-founder of Deep Root and a fellow of practice for strategic pro projects at the Blavatnik School of Government, University of Oxford, where he's the convener of the Council on State Fragility and the global engagement lead for the International Growth Center's State Fragility Initiative. 
Rafat previously served as Minister of Youth and Sports in the government of Yemen from 2014 to 2015. Also joining us today is Emma Bakum, Assistant Counsel at the Public International Law and Policy Group and lecturer at the Free University in Amsterdam, where she coordinates the International Law Clinic. Finally, we have Ithar Shaibani, Chief of Party for PILPG's Yemen program, overseeing the implementation of PILPG's programming and partner relations in Yemen. She has also worked as a solution-driven expert consultant for several Yemeni and regional programs, focusing on engaging a variety of stakeholders in the political process and transition. For full speaker biographies, please see the links sent in the Zoom chat and visit the PILPG website. Welcome everyone, and thank you for agreeing to participate in today's panel. My first question goes to Emma. Emma, can you tell us a little bit more about the motivation for this report? What was the focus of the report and the scope of the report? Yes, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Milena. Um, I'm very excited to be joining you and my amazing colleagues here today uh, for, the, for the launch of the, our report on Yemen's justice system. As already rightly noted, uh, the war in Yemen has had a devastating impact on the country and many aspects of its society. War has also severely damaged Yemen's state infrastructure, um, with no exceptions to its uh, justice system as well as institutions, um, including the judiciary, public prosecution, law enforcement, etc. The motivation for this report I really came down to, to shedding some more light on the aspect of the justice system in Yemen, as this had not been extensively done since the start of the war. We wanted to look at how, um, how the war has concretely impacted Yemen's legal systems, its legal practices, and the work of legal professionals, um, let's say, on a daily basis. So to do that, uh, Deep Root and PLPG set out to gather information from the Yemeni legal community, as well as stakeholders in six governorates. Um, and those were Aden, Hadramut, Ib, Marib, Sana'a, and Thais. And this all um, with the ultimate aim for the report to provide a holistic overview um, of Yemen's current justice system, both its formal and informal structures, and to outline key challenges. Um, and finally, and more important, and importantly as well, to outline the legal needs of Yemenis within those six governorates. Thank you, Emma. My next question is for Mohammed, and actually, Emma, what you just mentioned, the six governorates, that leads me perfectly well to my next question for Mohammed, which is, why did you choose to focus on these specific regions? What was the methodology behind the, the research here? Well, thanks, Milena, and thanks to everyone for, for uh, this event, uh, for launching the reports where me and the, the all colleagues been working hardly in this. Uh, the, uh, the methodology of choosing these six governorates is to cover, trying the best to cover uh, example governorates from the south and the north, uh, some which is under the internationally recognized government, other under the uh, Ansarullah de facto authority in Sana'a, and also covering rural areas and urban areas. So we can also give some glance, as Emma mentions, about the uh, Customary law, how it works in the uh, in both sides, the countryside and the uh, and the cities. The same thing, how the war affected the um, the urban and uh, affected the justice system in urban and rural areas. Uh, so we tried to cover uh, these as an example of other governorates, and we cannot definitely cover the twenty uh, governorates. So these governorates give a, a good example of the north, south, east, and west. And um, also, be, we consider uh, as well the uh, the security challenges regarding because of the uh, the war. Thank you. My next question is for Ethar. Ethar, let me turn to you for an overview of the current situation in Yemen. In particular, if you can reflect a little bit on the current legal structures in Yemen and where are we now in terms of what's there on the ground. Um, well, to be honest, um, I could say that ironically, you know, the, the term of 
development or evolution sounds so fitting and so ironic to describe the changes the legal system uh, exhibited as a result of the ongoing conflict. Um, in the sense that, you know, justice structures have definitely been morphing as a result of the changing power dynamics um, of the controlling authorities, as well as in the changes in terms of the political, you know, uh, regulations and aspects governed by the controlling authorities. Um, I'm also going to use the term justice structures here to encompass um, the wider formal and informal uh, mechanisms that were created uh, or enforced um, by the, the controlling party to resolve disputes in Yemen. Um, so to state the obvious, role of law in Yemen has been in a constant deterioration since 2011, um, mainly because of the, you know, the protests that occurred in 2011, aka the Arab Spring, uh, but also because of the political transition that followed. So during the transitional period, um, there was you know, a, a new constitution being drafted uh, and the legal system was in great anticipation for the new articles of the constitution, um, mainly because there was like a legislative uh, overhaul process that will follow. However, the conflict put an end to these plans. And since then, um, or since the escalation of the war in 2015, um, the Yemeni judiciary was uh, effectively absent. So when we say that, um, it, it can be described especially uh, for the cities that witnessed the most intense fighting such as Taiz and Aden. Um, and we found that the opposing interests of the key parties and the de facto authorities have undermined the authority of the Yemeni state or the Yemeni government, in this case, Hadi's government. Um, so basically the, continue, the country continued to fragment between areas controlled by Hadi's government and those controlled by Ansar Allah or the Southern Transitional Justice or other parties. So as a result, parallel legal structures have been created and have emerged that existed um, independent, mainly like separately from the uh, league, basically the formal legal structures that existed uh, pre-war. So the legal system started to see a spark of hope in 2017 when the judiciary had gradually began to resume activities despite the complex political, uh, you know, conflict and landscape at the time. Um, but there has not been any true um, basically resumptions of the activity in all of the government rates. So there are still many governments or districts that are still having issues with the inter, you know, the basically um, suspension of uh, their ability to get access to justice, mainly due to the many suspensions, suspensions that are uh, occurring in the judiciary. Um, and what complicated the situation further is that demand for the legal service, services has increased due to the, you know, the instability and lack of security in the area. Um, so with all of this happening, this resulted in a judiciary um, backlog where a lot of cases have started to pile and that also due to an increased inactivity of its services. Um, so what we saw is that in order to respond to this kind of demand, um, the informal legal structures and customary law practices um, often were the only reliable options for Yemenis to resolve their disputes. So uh, customary law has always been there since, um, you know, the start of time, of course, but also for most Yemenis, um, the customary law was the, a reliant option um, that could fill the void that was created by the absence of state. Um, so I think what I could say um, that will not perhaps be too much complex given the time constraint is that this report that we're discussing today uh, made an effort to examine all of these changes closely and to identify those hyperstructures um, and the opportunities they present for future engagement in role of law. In role of law. So um, I won't be monopolizing this conversation any longer, but 
I will leave it to my fellow panelists to discuss the details of that. Thank you. Thank you, Ethar. Um, again, your comments lead me really well to my next question, which is to Rafat. And I wanted to encourage Rafat to tell us a little bit more about the judicial system, the judicial structure in Yemen, as some of our audience members might not be familiar with the Yemeni legal system. Ethar already mentioned these two parallel structures, a formal state-sponsored system and then an informal system based on customary law. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, thanks, Milena. Uh, we're really glad that um, the report is finally launched and, and we think it covers a, a very important sector that is not um, well discussed and not a lot of attention goes into uh, the justice sector in, in Yemen, given the humanitarian crisis, of course, that is ongoing. But we think it's it's a critical uh, sector that is touching the lives of uh, millions of, of Yemenis. And as you said, um, it had already uh, covered a little bit uh, of it. In, in Yemen, we have a pluralistic system. So we've got the two legal structures working um, side by side. One is the formal structure. That's the state sponsored one. Um, you know, it's it's really based on civil law system, uh, which is in itself a combination of uh, both, uh, you know, Sharia law, customs, civil law, but all uh, codified in, in that. And uh, there's a number of key bodies. And I think what, what uh, distinguishes the report is um, it actually did a, a deep dive into each of these bodies, such as the Supreme Judicial Council, the Ministry uh, of Justice, the Office of Public Prosecutor, and looked at how these institutions uh, have uh, fragmented and how, how they evolved in, in the different areas of the country. Um, so that's, that's all within the formal uh, justice uh, structure. On the informal uh, legal structures in Yemen, you know, it's more a combination of tribal traditions, Sharia law, and it's mostly uh, uh, implemented or enforced by social obligations and by the community leaders, you know, whether they are the um, tribal sheikhs, tribal heads, uh, powerful non-state actors, which increasingly emerged uh, also in the report, you know, such as security forces, new security commanders. Um, and it's mostly upheld informally. Um, and we also have a very uh, widespread um, arbitration uh, culture as well, which is codified too in an arbitration act. So there is a little bit of, of formalization there, but it's mostly done in, in the informal sector. So these two interact together. And um, as Ithar mentioned, it, it, it's been very interesting to see during the conflict how uh, they've evolved differently and how at different stages one becomes more, much more uh, dominant than, than the other. Thank you. Um, this definitely sounds as a complex system, even without the conflict and even without the humanitarian crises, but I can just imagine how difficult all of this is currently in light of the ongoing conflict. So Mohammed, can you tell us a little bit about the most significant challenges to these legal structures in Yemen that you identified through your assessment and that is reflected in this report? Uh, yeah. So uh, first of all, we, we need to notice when we talk about the justice system in Yemen and how the war have been affected, that we are analyzing in exceptional circumstances. When we think about justice, we think of Ministry of Justice, the courts, the, the legal framework, uh, laws, and but with the collapse of states, everything, uh, as uh, Ithar mentioned, uh, the, the whole state is collapsed and we the justice system or the court is one of the state uh, ministries or, or branches, uh, but it can't work by itself. It needs the whole state uh, to push and support the, the, the justice system. Um, so however, the, uh, the, the war affected, and unfortunately, the, the credibility and the capability of uh, justice system in Yemen, especially the, the, the formal uh, justice system. For the uh, capability, it's, I mean, it have been, uh, as mentioned before, scattered between the authorities, uh, the um, international recognized government and Sarula in, in Sana'a and the ST, uh, the South, Southern uh, Justice, um, the, the Southern uh, Council in, in Aden also opposing the uh, government in, in uh, the, the international recognized government. All these fractions affected the capability of the justice system. Um, 
Also, the, the war affected a lot of damages have been physical damages to the uh, buildings, institu the justice institutions, the courts been some, uh, I mean, we, we did with Deep Root uh, a previous study on uh, 2019 and uh, more than 47 uh, of the courts buildings been damaged either partially or completely get damaged. Um, and when, when uh, as Ithar mentioned in Taiz or Aden, when the war like stopped in these cities, the collapse of these courts couldn't be resumed to work. Uh, and so they started resume the work in, in courts in very small apartments. So there was a physical damage uh, for the capability and even a uh, recent report uh, uh, on some governorates in Aden Taiz, um, the, the courts has lack of very basic needs um, like very basic, very basic needs for, for, for the courts to run its, uh, its task. Uh, also, the, the, uh, the security is a big challenge because as I mentioned, the, the court cannot function by itself if there is no law enforcement uh, power to support it, to provide security to judges, to provide security to lawyers. And we, we realize that a lot of judges, I mean, there is some judges been killed, some of them been kidnapped, missing. Uh, some of judges have been like flee the country for or relocated for their security. Lawyers prosecuted also, uh, prosecutors were also uh, threatened, killed, kidnapped. All this, uh, this security challenge, definitely a, a, a big challenge to, to run a justice system in a, in a normal way. Uh, the security uh, institutions as, as well, like the law enforcement been also affected by the war. It's not an exceptional, actually uh, the uh, law enforcement uh, forces have uh, been one of the main or direct uh, institutions get involved with, with the war. So then as we saw in Aden, for example, when the invasion of Aden, the security forces either participate in the war or some of them flee, same thing in Taiz. So the, there was an, a vacuum of the uh, law enforcement, which is open, the, uh, open an, a window or a door for other militias or non-state actors to uh, fill the gap with um, either their bias or taking a side to one or another. Uh, I mean, they are not fully independent. They are part of the the uh, uh, conflicting parties. Oh, this has become also a challenge because they are un, un, um, uh, trained uh, security forces and they are also, for the collapse of the state, they are not trained and they are not well equipped in front of the, the emerge of militias or non-state uh, or gangs or non-state act, uh, you know, uh, groups. So they couldn't provide security to, uh, to either to the justice system or to the, the people. So this is like one, some of the main uh, challenges beside uh, definitely as the, the, the war polarized the justice system. So th that's affected the, uh, we, we see like, um, as we've been talking, the fragmentation of the, uh, the, the judiciary and also the polarization of the uh, some of the legal uh, practitioners in, in in the field, which again these things affected uh, unfortunately the cred the credibility of the uh, justice system. Thank you. Now I would like to return to the topic of customary law. Ether, could you talk a little bit more about the role of customary law in Yemen and why it is so important and so prevalent? Thank you. Um, so as I've previously mentioned that um, basically customary law has been practiced in Yemen for ages and with most certainty I can say that it predates the establishment of the state. So the, these practices cover a variety of teachings, customs, traditions um, that were basically designed to deal with and resolve disputes. So the most common practices were basically a combination between mediation and arbitration. 
So based on customary law, um, arbitrations are done by a large variety of actors. For example, and also as described by Rafat, um, arbitrators can be um, sheikhs, military leaders, judges, legal practitioners, uh, religious leaders, neighborhood leaders or aqils, um, arbitration firms, or even arbitration committees that were selected by the concerned people. So most commonly, um, you will find that customary arbitrations uh, you know, used for cases in relation to land disputes, inheritance claims, as well as commercial disputes. However, it can also stretch to cover murders, family law cases, um, and, and so on. So, um, and there are also multiple factors that led the litigants to resort to informal customary law as opposing um, you know, seeking justice through the formal judiciary. And the reasons can be that um, we find that often it may be the only option they have, um, either because they live in a remote tribal area where the state has limited authority slash access or presence, um, or because there's the judiciary in itself or its systems are absent from the area. Another factor can be that um, Yemenis also consider informal arbitration practices to be more transparent, participatory, and efficient, and less corrupt than the state judiciary. And uh, for example, they also take uh, less time in order to reach a, you know, a decision or uh, for a case to be resolved through customary law when compared to the formal structures. Um, so we saw that some disputes are also better suited, or at least from the from the perspective of Yemenis. Some disputes are also better suited to customary arbitration. Um, for example, we've seen that a lot of you know, Yemenis prefer to go to customary law in order to resolve family law cases because they think um, that the customary law offers more privacy and maintains the confidentiality of uh, you know, their cases um, and, and the details within you know, the thing that led to a dispute. Um, so I think a final factor can be that customary law, which tends to provide, uh, you know, outcomes between the extremes of the Yemen's uh, penalty law and also the Sharia law, um, can, you know, basically in, in the eyes of some may, let, might, may lead to uh, more preferable outcomes in terms of compensation and what could be granted, uh, you know, um, in, in one of the cases, either in terms of, you know, compensation for, uh, you know, a case of murder or a killing, or in terms of compensation or penalty in terms of, uh, you know, a robbery case. So due to these factors combined and through our assessment, we've witnessed that the war has led to an increase um, in the use of customary law, as explained by my fellow uh, panelists, uh, even in urban areas, which, which was also surprising to us. So for example, Aden uh, being one with uh, a lot of you know, formal structures and, and have been through the history very reliant on formal structures, there also been a significant increase um, in terms of you know, applications, if we could call it that, uh, to to resolve disputes through customary law, um, especially between 2015 and 2015, uh, 2017, which basically suggests that it's a, a, a direct uh, impact of the war, um, and uh, and this could also be because most of the formal judiciary was not functioning at the time, uh, whereas customary law was uh, not widely practiced in Aden, but it started to be practiced in order to resolve um, and address the, you know, the increasing needs of the communities um, and the lack of, you know, any access to justice and, and the lack of uh, receiving any sort of like a, a state, um, you know, backup in order to resolve their cases and, and get these disputes sorted. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess that addresses maybe the, the question that you've asked. Thank you, Melina. Thank you. Now I would like to return to the re report itself. Emma, can you tell us a little bit about the main findings of the report? And if there's anything that 
uh, any of our panelists already mentioned that you also found um, during the assessment that's also included in the report. Does the report confirm much of what the panelists have already shared with us? Yes, thanks, Milena. Um, <clears throat> I think I'll just um, add one finding, one of the one of the key findings um, from the report that kind of builds onto what Ether just noted on the increased use increased use of customary law practice in urban areas, and that also kind of kind of underlines uh, what all of the panelists have already mentioned: this dynamic sh shifts in in either use of formal structures or informal structures by Yemenis. And so despite the shift that ITAR uh, mentioned in urban areas to use um, customary law practice more often, we actually saw the opposite shift um, in the traditional tribal city of Marib. And so while people in Marib tend to rely on tribal um, arbitration to settle disputes, we noted there an increased reliance on uh, the formal court proceedings um, during the war. And to give you some, some, some numbers here as well, before the war, Marib City had the lowest average of cases before formal courts uh, among all of the cities in, in Yemen, uh, with just 30 cases uh, per year and an average of two trial sessions uh, per day. And, and uh, as a shift from that, currently, um, what we've seen um, during our assessment is that courts in Marib are hearing approximately a thousand cases uh, per year instead of that number of 30 before. And, and therefore, in response, the, the number of judges um, in Marib City has also increased from, for instance, three in 2017 to nine now. Mm. And that those judges may, may work up to 100 to 150 um, cases now. So this, this is an interesting increase that we've seen in Marie, for instance, tribal areas, as opposed to the gen more general shift that we've noticed in, in urban areas. And this, there are, are a few explanations that could lead to it, that could explain this. And for instance, one of, of, of those is um, the demographic changes due to conflict generated internal displacement that we've witnessed. Um, I think as, as, as we are all aware, it has been estimated that uh, 4 million people have been internally displaced within Yemen since the, over the course of the war. Um, and, and for instance, Marib, the high number of internally displaced people or IDPs, um, it is currently actually hosting over 1 million IDPs. This has led um, to also an increase in legal needs of those IDPs and therefore also an increase in the cases um, that we see in, in um, the city and the governorate. Uh, many of those IDPs that have arrived in, in Marib have fled from uh, more urban areas um, and therefore tend to have no tribal ties because they, they are more used to the, uh, and because they are more used to the, to the formal court system, they also have a general preference now in, in Marib to, to rely on the formal judiciary um, for disputes as opposed to the, to the tribal systems that were used before. Um, and, and what we also um, saw as one of the explanations for the shift in Marib, a more a traditionally more tribal area, is that um, that there is right now the existence of a functioning formal system. After you know, in, in, in and we've also seen this in in Thais, for instance, after the, the state structures have been been absent during the war, during intense fighting. Um, now that um, state systems are gradually returning to their to their normal functioning, let's say. Um, Yemenis seem willing to rely on those formal straight stru state structures again once they once they resumed um, their functioning. Um, yeah, I'll leave with that as one of the the key findings to add to those that uh, the other panelists have mentioned already. Thank you, Emma. Um, my next question is for Mohammed. Mohammed, has the Yemeni Bar Association played a significant role in the country? Recently, what, what kind of a role does it play? Yeah, if you don't uh, mind, allow me to thanks Emma and Ithar for giving uh, th this uh, contradictory changes on the the practice between the formal and informal uh, um, justice system. Between Ithar, what mentioned about Aden, the, the switch uh, because of the absence of the government, switched toward more customary law, which is was like something more. E new to this level in in a urban city like Aden and in the other way is what's happening in Marib as Emma mentioned because a lot of uh, factors including the, uh, the demographic change and when people see uh, I mean Marib was a remote area with no uh, absence of uh, state so th these give uh, some of the unique uh, observation when 
we, we saw during the, the, the research. Uh, back to your question about the uh, Yemeni Bar Association. Um, I mean, when we talk about the Bar, uh, Yemeni Bar Association, we mean the lawyers. So the lawyers themselves have been affected uh, by the war uh, severely because the, uh, the, the, first of all, the security challenge and um, th many of these lawyers have been threatened and court been closed in several cities. As Ethan mentioned in the beginning, there was some cities like Aden and Taiz for more than two years, the, the court been closed uh, for, for about two years. These lawyers has no like income. Some of them have to, to go back to their villages uh, just to survive. Um, I mean, some lawyers even in, uh, uh, when we interviewed some lawyers in Sana'a, some of them, uh, their um, firms been closed and ridden uh, until today. Uh, these security challenges and the uh, financial, even, even the financial issue and challenge for th the whole uh, people, they start prefer not to hire a lawyer but instead to you know, get a short consulting because they can't afford uh, to pay uh, lawyers anymore. Uh, so the lawyer themselves been affected, which is definitely will affect the Yemeni Bar Association, which one of the, the, the issues that they, the last uh, election they had in 2000, uh, I, I guess, uh, nine before the, uh, before the, the whole political issues uh, been you know, uh, uh, erupted. Uh, and then the Yemeni Bar Association, as the whole justice system been scattered between the parties, that also affected the Yemeni Bar Association. So we have we have one in Aden and one in uh, actually we have three now: one uh, under the Ansarullah and one kind of under the uh, the Yemeni government, and one uh, affiliated with the Southern Transitional uh, Council. So the, the the Yemeni Bar Association is not uh, effective uh, anymore. And the only, and actually they are only effective or um, active in uh, personal uh, like level, some lawyers trying to help uh, like in a pro bono um, for, especially for uh, detainee or abs uh, kidnapped people for human rights issues. Um, so they try, they are only active now in a, in a, in a, in a personal level. Thank you. My next question is for Rafat. And here, let me quote from the report. The, ro the report states, quote, the loss of a significant portion of public revenues has greatly impacted the state's budget and its ability to fulfill its fiscal duties, including the payment of public salaries, end of quote. How has the economic collapse impacted the existing legal structures in Yemen? Yeah, I mean, as as uh, it's well covered, you know, Yemen is is going through the worst humanitarian crisis in the world, and this, of course, impacts all Yemenis, including the ones working in the uh, legal system. And so, if you look at the different components of of the legal system, whether it's the lawyers, whether it's the um, security uh, forces, whether it's the prosecutors or the judges. They have all, of course, been affected by the collapse in living standards, by the inflation that has happened in the country, by the loss of livelihoods, all the economic pressures and, and uh, on, on citizens equally affect them. Also, they have been affected by a problem that is uh, impacted all state employees. So it's the issue of public salaries where the because of the split in, in government authorities and because of the uh, lack of sufficient revenues, the uh, a lot of the state employees, including the security sector, have not been paid salaries regularly for the past five years or so. Um, this is especially true in Ansarallah controlled areas, uh, but also applies in, in government controlled areas um, and specifically to the security sector. Um, so not only, you know, they, of course, suffered from cuts in bonuses, uh, in, in salary payments that are not uh, regular in, uh, you know, all the staff retention, if you want to call it that. Um, and that's why they haven't been able to, to actually even um, attend to work. Um, lots of absences of employees um, since they're not pay, being paid salaries anymore. So they are going to look for other 
um, options or other livelihood uh, sources. And this, of course, puts a lot of pressure on the system as a whole because there aren't enough people to process the cases and, and to do all the, the work of, of the legal system as a whole. Um, but also law, law enforcement personnel, you know, we've heard multiple stories about, you know, why um, law enforcement is not able to, um, you know, to deploy, to either arrest people or to uh, implement uh, court orders. Uh, because they simply don't have uh, an operational budget anymore. They don't get their salaries. They, you know, the prices of fuel now is is so high, and the the operational budgets they used to have is still the same and not being paid anyways. Um, also, lawyers, you know, they they're not being able to to have a a living anymore. Uh, people are, you know, saving whatever money they have to just uh, cater to their basic necessities, food and, and other basic needs. Um, the deterioration in, in local currency, so you know, the value of the lawyer's fees don't, uh, don't have the same value anymore, and they're not able to increase their fees significantly to match the inflation levels because people cannot afford it. So all this you know, economic uh, issues and loss of, of revenues is directly impacting the, the work of all the different um, segments of, of the justice system in Yemen. Thank you. Now we're receiving some questions through the chat and I would like to turn to those now. The first question has to do with customary law. And the question says as follows, do you think customary law is sufficient, is a sufficient alternative to formal justice systems in Yemen? So Mohammed, let me, let me start with you. What do you think? Um, I guess it's a hard question, but uh, as Ethan mentioned in the beginning, even when we have when we had a, a functional state, uh, the, the majority of the cases have been resolved within the customary law, more than 80%, or there is uh, over than 60% now, uh, the approximate or around 80% of these cases resolve with um, with the customary law. And we have also to consider when we think about the customary law that the majority of the Yemeni population live in a remote area. Um, so they cannot reach cities where usually the courts uh, are uh, because of the infrastructure and the, a lot of the, it will need a lot of roads to go to there. I mean, it's also the budget will be high costly and training. So people it's, uh, will rely on the customary law and it's functional uh, and it has been functional, uh, especially with um, with the lack and the uh, anchor, the, the lack of uh, courts and the training law, uh, judges. And unfortunately there is um, uh, the, the, the credibility of the formal uh, justice system been like highlighted as corrupted, uh, takes long time and costs a lot of money. So the customary law been uh, functional and it's like works, especially during the, the absence of states. And uh, uh, with, with the tribal leader, uh, with the tribal areas, the remote areas, it been uh, functional to keep uh, social order and security. And because it, it also has a culture behind it, and it has uh, an enforcement mechanism. It's fast, regardless, definitely there is some uh, pros and cons, uh, and this is probably will lead to uh, maybe more uh, research on that, uh, about the pros and cons of the uh, uh, customary law. And definitely, I won't say it's, uh, even if we have a, like um, a stable state, it won't be an attitude to uh, eliminate the customary law, maybe some regulations, and trying to find how to uh, make these uh, two systems uh, work together. And internationally, there is uh, an attitude to recognize uh, the pluralistic le legal system. Uh, it's, it's globally to recognize the, uh, the community's uh, ways of arbitration and consultation to minimize uh, or solve uh, as, as alternative uh, way to uh, solve uh, disputes. Uh, as I said, there is uh, some uh, pros and cons, and uh, maybe one of these regarding the uh, human rights, women rights, uh, which is uh, totally can be uh, an issue. But if there is some support, training, providing, uh, you know, um, the concept of human rights and women rights, um, there's 
things can be done to elevate uh, the customer law. Thank you. Now we have another excellent question that came in through the Q&A. So let me read this question and perhaps Ethar can, can take this one. How do you see women's um, and other vulnerable groups access to the justice system? In tribal justice, women often depend upon the male members of their families and their demands are often not met. Can you discuss your assessment of local processes when it comes to women and other vulnerable groups? Yeah, of course. Um, what I can say is that even in pre-war date, um, women's access to justice has been a challenging process um, that remains an issue to date um, that affects the majority of Yemeni women. So there are so many obstacles to accessing the formal justice structures that include, you know, having um, the financial means or the legal documentation necessary to uh, open a claim or uh, make a complaint. Um, and a lot of women do not even have like an ID so that they can present it to the judges or to the legal system. Um, or might be prevented by their male relatives uh, from getting those or even obtaining any legal documentation that might be necessary to raise their cases. So um, there are uh, so many factors contributing to challenges uh, in relation to women's access to justice. Um, and I feel that customary law might add to these challenges um, because, you know, to access customary law, you need to have some sort of like a social status in order to be able to first reach uh, the, the the tribal leaders or the religious leaders or the uh, arbitrators that you will be uh, seeking a judgment from. Um, and most women will not have the opportunity to have this kind of direct interaction with with males or men in their community to be able to establish those kind of connections. Um, so my, my opinion, I feel that um, although customary law will try to resolve uh, you know, family cases and will try to uh, try to be just two women um, when, when a case is presented, um, there are still a lot of challenges that women will have to face within their own families, especially if the case includes, you know, um, a dispute within the family, um, in order for them to be able to actually raise their cases or raise their disputes to, uh, you know, customary law arbitrators to listen to. Um, and, and we're seeing similar you know, effect on other marginalized groups, including al um, machines or those who are ethnically different, uh, because again, their social status contributes to them having less opportunities to access those kind of structures uh, that were established by customary law. Um, however, I do turn, like I would prefer that um, another panelist add to that if they have like a different opinion or if, or if they could shed more light into the situation in Yemen in regards to women and uh, the marginalized groups. Thank you. Thank you, Ithar. Um, my next question then is for Emma, uh, but then also Mohammed or anybody else, if you'd like to weigh in on this, please let me know. What in your opinion, based on the research and your experiences are the most pressing legal needs for Yemeni citizens? Thanks, Milena. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I guess to start answering your question, I'll, I'll refer back to the, to the report as well as it underlines um, it, it, it underlines that ongoing conflict, um, displacement, as well as the absence of, of state security have led to a significant increase um, in crime and individual disputes um, throughout the country. Um, and alongside the human rights violations and crimes committed as part of the war that we see across the government, as I think, as I think many reports um, have shown, we also, throughout our um, assessment and research, saw a general pattern in terms of increased legal needs in all of the, the governance that we studied, um, such as increased land and rent disputes due to deterioration of living and economic conditions, um, including, for instance, the suspension of salaries and loss of income that Afat already touched upon, as well as cases that involve um, assault and theft. 
And I think specifically as, as the report, um, and, and I think that that's uh, worth mentioning here as well, the report specifically highlights the legal needs of internally displaced people, so um, as well as returnees, which I touched uh, upon before as well. Um, and these these issues that that IDPs and returners, returnees face relate generally to land and property disputes um, due to the war. For example, um, in IP governorate, we identify an increased number in property trading and contractual disputes. Um, the high number of IDPs there who fled from Taiz or, or Hodaida um, in the early early years of of the conflict created high housing demands. Um, leading to rent, property, and, and land value increases, um, which consequently also led, led to additional disputes and legal needs of, um, of people in, in the governor there. Um, similarly, for instance, in Thais, we saw uh, um, increase in personal status cases as well as individual land and property um, disputes there also due to land grabbing uh, by, by militias um, following mass displacement at the, at the start of the conflict. And so this situation um, has also given rise to new new uh, legal needs for returnees in Thaï. So those uh, displaced people that have now returned to their homes and may find other people or families actually um, living or occupying their homes. Um, so those are some of the, the, the legal needs that we identified in the report and that I think for now and also um, you know, post-conflict in Yemen are, are, are pressing um, needs for, for Yemenis. And I'll, I'll see if, if any of the other panelists have any addition to that, that in terms of needs. Thank you. Mohammed? Yeah, uh, thank you, Emma. Uh, yes, uh, I will follow with uh, what Emma mentioned about all of these, what the legal needs, the challenges, and how what's like um, the immediate needs for just a system. Uh, and before saying some of these, we need to realize that the sensitive about justice, because it's like a sovereign uh, state uh, body, so the intervenants, it's hard, it's not like an aid, um, any a nonprofit organization can provide aid to just a system, it needs to go through uh, like um, long, um, a, a complex uh, procedure. And um, so uh, helping the, uh, so, uh, so the, helping the justice system or the needs, we need to know that the, uh, the court is the last resort for uh, solving uh, the, the dispute, but to help justice system need to address these challenges, the root, what's happening, as Rafat mentioned, the, the economic challenges as all the, the for example, the, uh, the race of um, family issues, divorce and child custody, all the, the respondent to this uh, report uh, linked these, uh, the increase, the high increase of uh, divorce and, cast and custody and child custody to the economical uh, challenge uh, to the people. So trying to, I mean, trying to help uh, the root of these causes will help to like um, prevent the many cases, uh, which is, um, like become uh, uh, hard on, on the justice system to 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 meet, and maybe other uh, other way. For example, I mean we have different type. The, the the war affected the nature and the the amount of of cases, uh, and many of some of the respondents uh, we interviewed uh, judges and lawyers. They recommended, for example, uh, for the increase of. Um, family issues and divorce and custody to establish a family court like in Egypt or other uh, countries because it will help to face the increase of uh, these issues and also provide women uh, the privacy to uh, to um, will make it easier for them. Uh, so this, I mean, we also need to, to mention that the report is not comprehensive for whole Yemen. We need actually. Uh, we need a comprehensive uh, analysis of the damage on the uh, court, on the justice uh, institutions, the buildings. There is, to our knowledge, we couldn't find like a comprehensive analysis of what needs exactly to re, uh, rehabilitate, to reestablish, or pay the uh, rehabit the building been damages and how much that need. Uh, we couldn't cover all the the all governorates. So we need a comprehensive study and analysis fee for uh, if the justice system need to fix that, need a comprehensive analysis and budget 
uh, for a justice system. We need also an, uh, a more training for lawyers, the, the institution, the high, institu uh, the high judicial uh, institution uh, provide only like a, a very few numbers of every year for, for uh, future judges maybe need uh, uh, more support and training to uh, judicial, um, to the uh, judges and lawyers. And, and through the, uh, the research we found, because a lot of challenges, hard to mention that, the judges also been practicing administrative level, either because the, the administrative uh, employees at the court, they don't have the capacity or the, the, the learning, which is take the, the judges time in, instead of focusing on the, the, the cases, we'll do some administrative uh, work. So helping even in a micro and micro level uh, for the courts, providing supports and training, even for basic uh, skills for the employees at the court will help to uh, the, the function of, of, of uh, the courts. Uh, so what, um, we need to look about the general patterns in all governorates. And as Emma also mentioned, some governors has some special issues need to be addressed uh, specifically, and some are uh, in general uh, pattern. And maybe Rafat uh, has some uh, thing to add. Go ahead, Rafat. No, no, I think uh, I, I mean it covered. Mohammed covered uh, almost uh, everything that I wanted uh, to say, and I think um, I mean again the the main. Uh, what we keep hearing from everyone really, uh, both for the justice sector and, and for other sectors as well, the needs are so high, so significant. Um, the scale of needs is, is simply, you know, at all levels, um, which sometimes presents a challenge kind of where would someone begin and, and where, you know, where could be the, high, the biggest impact to, to deliver on, on the needs of people. So I think uh, this report might be a good uh, starting point at least to prioritize some of these interventions, start looking at, you know, if for whether it's for donors or um, associations and, and different uh, actors in this field, where can they start? And of course, for the government as well, and for uh, local authorities, I mean, the example um, in Marib and in Adan, you know, this provides just, you know, insights into where they could prioritize their functions. So I think this is what we are most um, interested in doing next, is really taking this report as a, as a stepping stone to, to see where we can uh, go with it and how can we provide support to this sector. Thank you. And my last question for today, as we're running out of time, is to Ethar. Ethar, do you have any recommendations for what could or should be the next steps in terms of judicial reform and minimizing the war's impact on the judicial system? I really think that um, further assessments and research should be made in order to first cover all of the government rates under, you know, basically all of the governors of Yemen and try to establish some sort of like a basic understanding of all of the needs. I know that Mohammed have already covered some of the ideas that could be perhaps pursued in that effort. Um, however, having this kind of basic understanding of the needs and having, um, you know, basically, I think this information would be necessary to first commit international donors and also those who are interested in building or rebuilding or reshaping um, the legal system or the judiciary in Yemen. Um, um, you know, basically, we would like to build some sort of, uh, uh, you know, a commitment for a strategic long-term engagement that will guarantee results towards the end, rather than the, you know, the tab and go kind of interventions that are currently being implemented by most donors that usually focus on a certain aspect um, that could not produce results without an like a general overhaul for the system as a whole. Um, so all of that considered, um, we, we would definitely want to see um, some sort of, you know, at least uh, like, um, basically a thematic intervention that is led by the international donors as well as the local communities being the main consultants that should be taken uh, into consideration and whose voices should be heard uh, to design um, maybe something on the basis of the hybrid structures that were created post-war so that we can first stabilize the communities 
address current disputes and then look onwards towards how to deal with future disputes and the reform of uh, the ongoing or the modern judiciary system for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Unfortunately, that is all that we've got time for today. Thank you for joining us and submitting your questions. The webinar recording will be available on the PLPG website and shared with all the attendees on Zoom via email. This event was part of the PLPG Thought Leadership Initiative Series. Thank you very much to our panelists for taking the time today to talk about the impact of the War on Yemen's Justice System report, sharing its main findings, and your thoughts about the situation in Yemen. I encourage everyone to follow this initiative and join us for the next event. Thank you and have a great rest of the day.